Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear friends, Allah bless you all. Let's continue. Okay, Al Fatiha. Bismillahir Rahman. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Salatan tufrihuhu wa tusaiduhu turdihi Wajzihi biha anna ma huwa ahluhu ya arhamar rahimin wa alihi wa salim Allahumma zidna wala wala tanqusna Wa akrimna wala tuhinna wa a'tina wala tahrimna wa athirna wala tuthir alayna Wa ardina wa ardu anna ya kareem so, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I mean, we ended last time by looking at some of the criticisms the Munafiqoon were unfairly and unjustly directing towards the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala now exposes them and shows that they were the ones who were actually in the wrong. The actions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam be it his distribution of zakat or the way he was with people it was all in accordance with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the pleasure of Allah Allah loved the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah loved the the way the messenger of Allah was what he did it was all in congruent with the the the, the, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the things that Allah loves so they were saying you know why is he giving charity to these people and you know making fun out of the recipients of charity and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighted that you know when they get something they're, they're happy you know for a short while but if they don't get something they revert back to their default anger and bitterness right towards the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa so Allah azza wa jal says to us here then walaw annahum radu ma atahum Allah wa rasuluhu wa qalu hasbuna Allah sayu'tina Allah min fadlihi wa rasuluhu inna ila Allah raghibun that would you know okay if only they had been content with what Allah and his messenger had been had given to them and said <coughs> Allah is sufficient for us Allah will grant us out of his bounty and so will his messenger to Allah alone return with hope so the whole verse is saying if only they said they said and did this what would that, uh, the result be it would be better for them like just doing and saying this would be better and it's not just uh, empty words, it's, it's actually being characterized uh, with conviction internally uh, at these words, uh, you know, what they were saying, you know, that, you know, they were content with what Allah gave and, you know, accepting it. That's what would be better for them. So he's, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ رَضُوا مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And uh, it's interesting he uses the, the verb آتَى, not إِعْطَى or أَعْطَى. Um, there's a difference between them. Ata indicates there's a lot. So, yu'teen Allah, he will give a lot. Whereas in the previous verse, uh, they were, uh, Allah is using for, for in u'atu, if they've been given. So, i'ta is, you know, a, a lesser amount. So, here, you know, from their perspective, you know, they're like, oh, no matter what it is, they're going to think it's insignificant. But Allah is saying that, no, like what Allah gives, it gives, you know, uh, with wisdom. And Allah can give vast amounts. Right? So he says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ رَضُوا مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ If only they were happy with what Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ultimate supreme king, and his messenger gave them. The first thing we see from this is uh, an uh, approval. <coughs> it's an approval of the action of the messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say using the supreme name here in the verse indicates that whatever the messenger did, however much he gave, it was with the approval of God. And, you know, this atah, this vast amount, those people, you could give them a huge amount and they'll still think it's, 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 it's paltry because they're, not, they're never content, right? So he's saying if only they were content and happy with what uh, Allah gave, 
by his command and even if he didn't give a, a specific instruction you know he left it to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam to decide how to distribute the, these things and that that's that's good that should be good enough for them the whatever the messenger does then sallallahu alayhi wasallam is in in line and in accordance with what allah wants so he has allah's approval so bimtahumullahu مَا أَتَاهُمَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَقَالُوا And if only they were happy with this internally, like if you think, oh no, I, I, I wanted this, I haven't got this, you think, you know what, Allah gave me the amount that's good for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's best for me. Maybe if I got more, that would lead me to do to doing things that are harmful for me or, it, you know, it would have been bad for me. So, I'm happy with what Allah decided. And then, وَقَالُوا And if only they said, so the statement is a, a reaffirmation for you know what they're supposed to feel inwardly. And it's also expression, an expression of their contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and His Messenger. حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for us. Allah is the one who gives and whatever Allah gives, however much He gives, whichever way He gives, He's enough for us. His generosity, His wisdom, it's enough for us for, to, to rely on. And you know, that's enough. سَيُؤْتِينَ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَرَسُولُهُ Soon, Allah will certainly give us from His generosity, of His generosity, as will His messenger. So they have a good, beautiful opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of his messenger and both of these things are tremendous uh, ways of drawing bringing good to oneself having a good a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then for them to to be confident that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is always going to be good to them just because they don't get something in a particular sim situation doesn't mean he has uh, ill will you know towards them no he has good will to everyone as we've seen some of the coming verses, even the Munafiqun had a, a share of this goodwill from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, <coughs> if only they said, Allah is enough, <coughs> whatever Allah gives and however He chooses, that's, that's more than enough. And, سَيُؤْتِينَ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَرَسُولُهُ And, you know, whatever we, we hope for, we, we, Allah will give us, right? Inna ila Allahi raghibun, and we in Allah are desirous. We of Allah are desirous, meaning that the whole focus and you know it should all be about pleasing Allah, wanting to be slaves of Allah. How does Allah? Uh, want me to be in this situation outwardly, inwardly what does he want from me but the munafiqun were the opposite instead of putting Allah at the center of their existence they put themselves at the center of their existence and you see people do this and they think oh well I think things haven't gone my way I haven't been given this I, I, I deserve more but in your mind you might deserve more but Allah's wisdom and Allah's knowledge you know <laughs> has decided that there's something else right that you don't deserve you know more than you're not the center of the universe and the amount Allah gives is actually what's best for you and just having that understanding um, so these people didn't have that you know they should have realized that um, uh, to be focused uh, on pleasing Allah is what's superior. So this is what the ulama say, right? About like you, if something good comes to you from, you know, of in your deen or your dunya or your akhirah, you know, um, like some good news about the akhirah, like you, say, say someone sees a, a blessed dream or something, then you say, Hasbun Allah, sayyutin Allahu min fadli, or min fadli wa rasulu inna ilallahi rahibun. It's part of the good adab to show the opposite of the state of the munafiqun, munafiqin. Um, yeah. So, so then after saying this to them, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. <coughs> and you also note, you know, the, the use of the supreme name three times. Uh, the Allah and His Messenger gave them this, so they should be should have been content. And then they should have been saying, Allah, the supreme King, the the ultimate perfect Lord, Him. You know, he's enough for us. And that we're desirous of him, him alone, ilallahi. The sentence structure normally would have been inna raghibuna ilallah. But inna ilallahi, you know, of him alone, you know, we're desirous to, you know, for his generosity and, you know, to please him.
It's a tremendous verse, it's a tremendous verse. And then, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to show that they were wrong, wrong, they were wrong in their assessment of who deserves zakat, they were wrong in their assessment of who deserves charity, they were wrong in, in their assessment of saying that they were deserving. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spelled it out here, who deserves what. And, and here we have, you know, um, a, a, you know, we have a breakdown of the recipients of zakat. Although this, this verse is talking about sadaqat, in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the word sadaqah was used primarily for zakat. Um, as for voluntary, voluntary ch charity, it, it was used for that. And there are other words, you know, for example, or nafila. Uh, nafila generally for the prayer, but you know, the, these, the, uh, there were other words being used. Um, so the, the majority of scholars said that the, the coming verse uh, applies to the recipients of zakat. And uh, there is a distinction. So you have to be one of these categories to receive your zakat legitimately. Um, uh, although there are many, many more details uh, that the the fuqaha have uh, uh, detailed or listed in in the books of fiqh, it's well worth studying this properly. Uh, upon whom is zakat due? Who can't receive zakat? Because you you can have people who, um, although they're not poor, they're not uh, although they don't have to give zakat. I should say they may not have enough wealth to give zakat, but they can't receive it. Right, and you know it's called Nisab al Hirman in the Hanafi school. It's well worth studying this. Um, there are those who um, who can receive it, right? And how much can you give them? There are, there's many details. When do you pay? When do you not have to pay? So it's well worth studying. So here is just a, a look at uh, who deserves the zakat, and this is coming from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and. You know, there's a narration uh, by narrated by Imam Abu Dawood that a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said, "Give me from the sadaqa, give me something from the sadaqa." And the Messenger of Allah said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Inna Allah lam yarda bi hukm nabiyin wa la ghairihi." Right? Uh, um, uh, في الصدقات حتى حكم فيها هو الله was not happy was not content with the the ruling of a prophet nor anyone else when it comes to the matter of charity until you know so such that he decided to to um, judge who gets it right it's just like with inheritance Allah specifically stipulated uh, who gets what and uh, there's no ijtihad in this now you know Allah has decided it and that's it so he said uh, um, asnaf. <coughs> so he divided it into eight categories and if you're one of those uh, categories I'll give you it he said so he says إنما الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين والعاملين عليها والمؤلفة قلوبهم وفي الرقاب والغارمين وفي سبيل الله وابن السبيل. So he says alms tax. You can see you can see which uh, position he's going with in the, in the translation that is is referring to zakat. So zakat, so sadaqat, meaning zakat, uh, is only for the poor and the needy, for those uh, employed to administer it, for those whose hearts are attracted to the faith, for freeing slaves and for those in debt, uh, for Allah's cause and for needy travelers. Okay, so the first thing we see here is the word innama. It's clear, it's obvious, right? These two matters, uh, it's clear, clear. And it's specifically for these groups. It, so zakat, yeah, sadaqa, normal charity, you can give it to anyone, right? Muslim, non-Muslim. But zakat is given to Muslims alone, right? So <coughs> there were some situations where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave it to non-Muslims, but um, that category is gone, uh, as we'll see now. So he says, "Innama sadaqatu." Clearly, charity is only for, and, and you know, these categories. So he's saying that. 
this is clear, this is obvious, it's only for this group. So who are you to start criticizing the messenger? Oh, he hasn't given it to us. He hasn't given it to this type of person or that particular individual. The sadaqat, the, the, the charity, the zakat is for a specific set of people. And if you're not entitled to it, you're not entitled to it. It's as simple as that. So it's showing the, the, you know, you know, the folly of their ways and you know that their criticism was wrong. Right? It was unwarranted. Innama <laughs> sadaqatu. Uh, so the fakir is someone who has some he's poor but he has something right he has um there is actually one fiqh point i will go into which is uh, in the, in the hanafi school <coughs> when you talk when you talk about the currency and stuff they say talking about that you should give uh, give zakat in that which is the most beneficial for poor people right so for example if you were to uh, so in the past if you were to give someone your, your, your zakat in gold coins and he can easily spend gold do it um, if it's easier to spend silver give it to him in silver right and so this translates in our times to this uh, 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 a, a complex issue on uh, of uh, currencies and um, uh, economies so you have so uh, you know some parts of the world where uh, you know the economy is weak and some parts of the world where the economy is stronger and initially the amount that was uh, uh, specified that zakat needs to be paid when you have this much money it was a certain amount of gold and a certain amount of silver clearly there was a bit more silver but that amount compared to the gold was of equivalent value now uh, there's a huge disparity, you know, a huge disparity between the, the values of gold and silver. So, um, for for stronger currencies and stronger economies, um, it would make more sense if uh, if they calculated gold. Um, there's a cut by gold by the gold standard. Now, how much is X amount of gold worth? This much? Okay, you're now wealthy. You pay the cut. Um, otherwise, if if you did it by silver, then like in England, I think. The silver, the sub amount of silver is like 250 pounds or something like that. You can't really be classed as wealthy, you know, but if you have an excess 250 pounds beyond above and beyond your needs. But whereas if you have that much in maybe another, um, uh, maybe another uh, country where the economy is uh, weaker, then yes, you know, it could be classed as wealth. So that's the simpler way anyway um let's go back so he says the the faqir lil fuqara wal masakin in the hanafi school we say the faqir who is he who has something and the miskin is someone who has nothing in the shafi'i school it's flipped uh, they say the miskin has something and uh, the faqir has nothing <coughs> in reality i mean there's not much of a, a practical difference but um each side has their proofs. Um, I'm a Hanafi. Uh, I do believe the Hanafi position is actually stronger. But anyway, so uh, Fakir from the word Fiqar, which is, uh, the, is, is, is the backbone, it's the spine. So it's like saying that someone whose spine is broken, he can't move and then he gets into debt, so he's, he's going to be poor. Or he can't work to function, so he's going to be poor. Uh, and then the word was then taken to just refer to anyone who's poor. Uh, so that's the word faqir, the word miskin from sukun to be still. So he's so poor, he can't he can't eat. So 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 basically he can't move because he doesn't have the energy to move, right? And the poverty is just you know forced him into stillness, you could say. Um, so both categories. So as I said, the first group in the Hanafi school, uh, those who have something is not doesn't reach the standard of wealth, being wealthy, um, and the miskin has nothing, right? Al-Fuqara'i wal masaki wal amilina alayha and those employed to administer it and collect it. So this was this particular group up until the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. <coughs> so during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, in the time of the first three Khalifas, well, the Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu, um, people would give their zakat to a collector. So ka, well, it was gold and silver, and they'd give their animals, right? If you have like 40 sheep, you give one sheep in zakat and these things. It's, it's all detailed in the books of fiqh. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would appoint people to go to such and such area and collect their zakat. And you go to that area and collect their zakat. And 
Um, then in the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, um, cash and gold and silver, people were left to do it themselves and the animals were collected by the state. So he changed it slightly, radiallahu anhu wa arda. So, um, those appointed by the government to go and collect zakat. So, <coughs> this is because they're giving up their own time. Their time where they could be earning a living for themselves, they give, they give that up for the general, you know, well-being of the Muslim community. So, because of this, that they're entitled to, you know, to be recipients. And then the books of fiqh give details that um, they need to, there has to be enough zakat, to, you know, to go around, you know, for, for people. So if they only collect enough for their amount, then, you know, they don't get it, right? Because it's supposed to be out there helping the community um, and helping the Muslims in, in general. Well, Amilina alayha and those uh, appointed to uh, cover it. Okay. وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ And for those whose hearts are, uh, are to be reconciled, you could say. So, تَأْلِيفُ الْقُلُوبِ is to make hearts uh, agreeable to each other. And this was a particular group. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ gave zakat to, um, sometimes it was to non-Muslims who it was fear that they may attack or they may join with the group who's going to attack the, uh, the Muslims and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the early days you know he gave he gave some zakat to them or some, some money to them to you know to prevent that harm from occurring to the Muslims there were other situations where there were people who were new to Iman or people of weak Iman and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave them uh, gave them it in order you know they may be wealthy but he, he gave them it in order to to bring their hearts closer to Islam. So, for example, we have Safan ibn Umayya, who um, uh, he still wasn't a Muslim after the conquest of Mecca, and he said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam started to give to me, and he was the most dest detested person in my sight. And he kept giving me and giving me and giving me until uh, until I believed. He ended up accepting Islam, and he was the most beloved person to me. Right? Why? Because seeing that you know this is not just any old person this is someone who doesn't uh, who doesn't want to hold on to the things of this world he wants the well-being of people the well-being in the akhirah safety from the hellfire these sorts of things so he kept giving and giving and giving and giving and Safan realized this isn't you know someone who seeks power and wealth and fame and money this is someone like that he's, he's genuinely a prophet so uh, he accepted Islam uh, and then uh, so those who are weak of faith or new to faith um, <coughs> or those who, you know, it was hoped that um, they would accept faith, right? Um, and there's various people like this, uh, Abbas ibn Mirdas, uh, uh, Al-Aqra ibn Habis, Uyayna um, ibn Hisn, these people, this Uyayna ibn Hisn, for example, he, uh, he said he was a Muslim for quite a while earlier, although there are questions around that. And, uh, and then he was even captured fighting the Muslims, as Ibn Hajar al Asqalani mentioned. Uh, and then after that, he became a, a good, sincere, devout believer. But in the early days, you know, he, he wasn't. But the Prophet, وسلم, because he was the head of his tribe, and to pre prevent the harm and bring them closer to Islam, he did give to these people. Uh, and then we have Wafir Riqab. Now the style uh, of expression is changed because. Innama sadaqatu lil fuqara. So the lamb indicates that they're deserving, they deserve to be made the owners of this zakat. But now the matter, fir riqab and in uh, freeing slaves. So there's various interpretations. A slave who's made a deal with his master, called a mukatab, to buy his freedom, like he works, earns a bit of money, saves and gives certain installments. Like you, you can help him with the installments. Or some of the ulama said that um, that you can purchase slaves and just free them and that'll be a zakat done. And you know, there's, what's of note here is the emphasis Islam placed on um, f the freeing of slaves, right? And it was, you know, the Sharia is geared towards ending this thing in society. And uh, so, yeah, so there's that. And others have said, Wafir Riqab, the it's a Dharfi Majaziya, it's metaphorically, it's a metaphorical way of expressing, uh, it's as though, um, 
It's, it's, it's a way of saying, uh, uh, highlighting the importance of this particular avenue of uh, zakat. So he says, well, and those, uh, those in debt. So haram is something that sticks to you. In adabaha, Rabb nasrif anna adaba jahannam. In adabaha kana harama. Our Lord deflect from us the punishment of hell, uh, of jahannam. Its punishment is clinging. It sticks to a person. So what would happen is a person would lend someone money and if the person doesn't pay it back, then the, the lender would be able to go, you know, just, just follow him everywhere until he can get his money. And so mean. so this is people who are in debt and despite, even if they they have nisab, you know, the, the nisab is, the debt is greater than what they have. So you can, you can, you can, you can give money to them and pay off their debts. This is something central in society. Uh, people are usually in need of <coughs> aid financially in one way or another and helping people who have who are in debts uh, helps a lot you know helps people a lot. and in the way of Allah and this has been this was uh, interpreted by the ulama in, in various ways in the way of Allah. Some talked about um, giving money to go uh, for, to people to, to go and uh, perform the hajj. Uh, others talked about um, funding military campaigns. Others talked about um, uh, sponsoring students of knowledge. Some talked about giving it to the ulama. These sorts of things. So it's a broad, it's a broad category. Wafi sabilillah, and in the way of Allah. And you know, a sabil is a, a a road that can be tread with ease. You know, you travel it. Allah facilitates it. And so you know, a road that can be travelled with ease. And so giving it in this way to facilitate the actions of good. So, for example, if you give your money to a student of knowledge who's learning the deen, you know, whatever he learns, whatever he teaches, you know, you benefit from, right? Or fi sabilillahi. Wa sabil and the son of the road, literally. It means a traveller. So a traveller who doesn't have his money with him and there's no way of, you know, he could have a big pot of gold at home, but there's no way of accessing it. So giving your zakat to him is also um, a legitimate uh, and then the ulama said that it can't be a, a, um, a journey of sin he can't be planning on going committing a sin you know he's going to go to the next country and go you know kill <laughs> kill the guy who you know ate the tree ate from the apple in his garden or something uh, it can't be like that and then he says, "Fariidatan min Allah, wallahu alimun hakim." This is a, a huge obligation from Allah, and Allah is all knowing, all wise. Farida, if you remember, when we looked in Surah An Nisa, it talks about farida is a distribution, like a division. So, like I said, if you cut up a cake into eight slices, you know each slice would be classed as a fard. You know, um, not obligation as in as in like with the prayer, but a division, a distribution. So it's a, it's a distribution from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and He's the supreme King. He can do what He wants. He can command. This is His religion, so He can command what He wants. And on top of that, Wallahu Allah, the supreme King, once again, Alimun Hakim is supremely knowledgeable, and so He knows everything. He knows what people have. He knows what people, you know, don't have he knows who deserves what and he's supremely wise he knows where where the best distribution of wealth will be in, in what way how so it's for us to submit and surrender and say oh Allah you know best and we accept it and then we move on to another criticism you know unfair criticism or insult to be honest with you that they were leveling towards the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says وَمِنْهُمُ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِيِّ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ And there are others who hurt the Prophet. وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ أُذُنْ And they say he, he listens to anyone. Literally means he's an ear. قُلْ أُذُنُ خَيْرٍ لَكُمْ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَيُؤْمِنُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلَّذِينَ آمِنُوا مِنْكُمْ لِلَّذِينَ آمِنُوا مِنْكُمْ I believe... وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ There's a bit of a typo in that verse. Uh, so here he says, وَمِنْهُمُ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِيَّ وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ أُذُنَ So amongst the munafiqoon, 
there there were people who insult the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they say he's an ear so this is something that the arabs is a type of usage of language the arabs did quite often by saying someone is an ear uh, so it was someone called uh, julas ibn suwaid ibn samit right he was sat with the you know anbudia ibn thabit you know he was sat with they were sat with each other and someone said oh no don't say this and lest the prophet hear about it so he said oh no don't worry you know he's an ear like he he listens to whatever we say we can just go there swear an oath and he'll believe us so like the arabs call a spy an eye right an ayn meaning so the, the spy is his, his most important you know the most important thing he has is his sight so he can go and actually see right and then report back so he sees right so the uh, an udhun when they were saying this out of the bilad they were saying he's an uh, an ear as in you know like you can't control what goes into your ear your ear picks up all sounds so they were saying oh, we can say whatever whatever we want and he'll he'll just listen to it all and then he'll he'll believe us so they were saying that he believes anything you know almost you know they they they're, in, they're saying that a'udhu billah it's just a believer to him like repeating these things but you know they were saying that you know he doesn't distinguish between what's right and what's wrong what makes sense what doesn't like you can say whatever you want swear an oath and you know he'll believe you and that's clearly wrong right and uh, so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says qul huwa udhunu khairin lakum and so allah says say he's an ear of good meaning so here firstly there's some uh, it's very emphatic uh, you say rajul sidqin right instead of saying, saying rajul uh, rajul sadiq um uh, a truthful man you say a man of truth he also works in english so he uh, an ear of good so he listens to to the things that are good and that are beneficial and he can distinguish what's right and wrong and you know uh, what's said sincerely and what's said you know with ulterior motives he can distinguish all of that and so you know one of the ulama said that this is uh, the, the strong, a very strong way of uh, uh, um uh, rejecting them uh, ibn munayyir you know he said uh, it's as though he's agreeing with them but then he says some the exact opposite right it's a way of rejecting their criticism insulting them so he's saying qul huwa udhunu khairin right showing that they're wrong so he's a, he's an ear of good right how he says so uh, the prophet hears and he can distinguish what's right and what's wrong what's good what's bad and then he says qul huwa udhunu khairin lakum yu'minu billahi he believes in allah and uh, yu'minu billahi wa yu'minu lil mu'minin so he believes in allah and then clearly whatever comes to him of revelation he hears that and you know he tells people this right he accepts it he knows it to be true and so through him we learn about the revelation of god there's the khair immediately there's the good and benefit immediately and then wa yu'minu lil mu'minin and he makes the believers the firm mu'minin those who are firm in their faith true believers makes them feel secure the things that they want to come and tell him he hears them and the good that they say and all the things that um, that will help the muslims and unite the muslims and continue to strengthen their bonds he hears all of that and so he knows who was truthful who was sincere and who uh, and you know which people have come uh, with with a good heart towards him and good intentions and we you know lil mu'minin so he makes them feel safe this lam indicates that you know you mean li in the case that you make someone feel safe from feeling like you don't you don't believe them like you're rejecting what they're saying no so believe the believers feel confident and uncomfortable that they can go to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you know say these things and he, you know he'll believe them and it's not like you know he's just going to dismiss them out of hand you know immediately um and wa rahmatun lil ladina amanu minkum and is also a source of mercy for those who have shown belief from amongst you when he's talking about the real believers he uses the ism fa'il uh, the true firm mu'minin the firm believers but now here he's using those who just uh, uh, do an act 
to say that they're believers. Uh, they, they come, meaning the munafiqeen, they come and they claim, they say, oh, we believe, you know, I am a believer, you know, they, they say. So uh, he's saying, and he's a tremendous, tremendous, it's as though his mercy itself. He's a tremendous source of mercy and kindness and goodness, you know, for those who have believed from amongst you quote unquote um, so this is what the ulama have said that and then the ism fa'il previously talking about the real believers is used to show that their true faith is true whereas these people the munafiqun would come with their fake iman and they would say things to him and he says he's a tremendous source of mercy for you they used to think oh he believes anything no the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew what they were saying knew when they were lying but he 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 veiled them he didn't expose them he allowed them to continue and you know less than he you know uh, you know they, they say okay they're disbelievers and then other things start you know rulings that are applied um like if they start fighting the muslims or something he allowed he gave them their safe space he allowed them and with that safe space is also the opportunity for them to stop and think well you know what maybe we're wrong in this and then uh, you know to, to turn back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and become real believers so he veiled their faults and he veiled the lies that they were doing. This is a source of goodness and mercy. This is what the Messenger was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not their wrong and vile interpretation of his actions. In reality, they were just talking about their own, you know, their own selves. As we see a lot, you know, those who insult the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they usually just bringing out the, you know, the, fire, the, the vile traits in their own selves. He says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And those who hurt, or oh, yeah, <coughs> this, is, this is more than physical harm, it's even emotional pain. Those who cause uh, offense and pain, those who hurt the Messenger of Allah, who? The Messenger of Allah, Allah's Supreme, the Supreme King, His Messenger, you think is not going to uh, look after Him? And you think that the Messenger of God does not have any sanctity and specialness? Of course He does, more than anyone. Lahum Adabun Alim, theirs, it's almost like, you know, it's a promise, you know, this is for you, and this is for you, you know, theirs uh, is a Adabun, a tremendously painful punishment and then it's adjective alim supremely painful so it's it's just a, a horrendously painful punishment they're going to have what's also interesting is uh, just you know the beautiful word usage here he says they were saying udhun with a hamza dal and noon and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word yudhun which also has the Hamza Dhal and Noon. Okay, there are a couple of additional letters and a different meaning, but it's the, the, the correlation is quite beautiful uh, in just in terms of the Arabic. And so this is it. You know, these people were just wrong in the way they uh, spoke to the Messenger, the way they spoke about the Messenger, the way they thought he was, you know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And A'udhu Billah. And they brought a lot of harm on themselves. So Allah protect us and make us of those people who always maintain and uphold the dignity and love and reverence of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in our hearts, in our lives, in all aspects of our mind. I mean, uh, of everything, right? I mean, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.